Everyone that is joining from around the world, we are thrilled to welcome you to our special United Nations headquarters tour with the team at the UN. I'm joined today by Ayush Chopra, our amazing youth ambassador in Canada by way of India. And I know you all have met him in our weekly videos, but today you get to see him live and here in our video call. So Ayush, do you wanna to wave to everybody? I see like lots of faces. So I don't even see you yet here in the crowd, but hopefully when it comes up, you pop up with me. <laughs> Just wave, hey. Great to see you all. I'm gonna share my screen. We have a special hour of all sorts of information that we're gonna be sharing. We're gonna kick it off talking about our goals project. We have classrooms from over 3000 uh, schools that will be joining with us for the project and for today's session. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about the goals project and then we're gonna jump right into our special tour with the United Nations. So let me share my screen. And then we'll get going. All right. Okay. So um, we wanted to kick off with some etiquette and norms. Since we have a thousand people that will be joining here in our Zoom room and then thousands more joining on our Facebook group, we wanted to make sure to set you all up for success. So our team on our side has been thinking about our own norms and etiquette. So with people from all around the world who bring different experiences and understandings, we wanna make sure that we honor that. We also want to invite you to bring um, your perspectives and be open to new ideas and new perspectives from others. We're gonna to approach today's session with optimism and kindness. And we'd love to ask you to share your ideas in the chat box as we go. So today for us and with the Goals Project is all about access to ideas, information and opportunities. So what we'd love to do is empower you to take action through different opportunities. So today, if you haven't had the opportunity to go to New York City and join at the headquarters, you're going to see into the headquarters and you're going to meet the team who works there. So please feel free to add your questions. We know that some of you have been adding questions in advance of today's session. And at the end of the tour, the UN team is going to be taking those questions and hopefully giving you some ways that you can keep connecting with them after today's call. If you notice, um, if you're not hosting, then you're on mute. But we want to make sure that that mute button doesn't silence you. Please be adding any ideas, questions you have into the chat box. And we have a team of uh, our interns who are going to be looking through those and responding to you with information and with resources. So watch for those links and please be sure to pass it on. So anyone on social media, we'd love to have you follow Take Action EDU and Visit UN. And we'll be using the hashtags goals project and visit UN as we go. All right, so look at all of these classrooms all around the world. We are covering planet earth with the goals project. So we had a student as young as age three. If you're in our three to six year old group, please be sure to wave your hands. So age three to six, all the way up through university. So youth are taking action. I know that Ayush in our last schools project talked about the power of collective action. So imagine if all of these students in all of these classrooms, each even just do one small thing, the impact we can have for our planet and for our people. As we go, we are guided by these 17 global goals. Now, I know that each classroom has been gifted a goal. So each of you are working on one specific goal. In education, we have our very own goal, which I know Ayush and I, uh, we hold close to our heart with SDG4. But we really believe that all of these SDGs these global goals are connected and linked together. So regardless of the goal that your class is working on, we all have a responsibility for all 17 of these goals. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that as we go through our tour. 
So, in addition to all of these classrooms, we have a team leading the way. So I'd like to thank our 34 facilitators who are leading your group. If you see your facilitator, make sure you're waving to them. You can send them a message in the chat box. They have been helping. They've been responding to teacher questions. I know a lot of them are doing Zoom calls and they have WhatsApp groups and they're even talking about Twitter chats. So they're here to help and guide you as you're jumping into your goal over the next few weeks. We have a team of youth ambassadors uh, led by Ayush. He'll be joining, uh, sharing a little bit about his work in a moment. And we have Lena and Abby and Herman and Carla and Itziar. So if you see our interns, please be sure to wave to them. They're behind the scenes. So they're running our social media, they're blogging, they're helping us prepare for events like today. So special thanks to them. And for this goals project, we have a team of translators. So we're translating the goals project curriculum into Spanish, Italian, German, Arabic, Hindi, Chinese, Chinese simplified, French, and Romanian. So if you haven't checked out the translations, you can head to goalsproject.org. Under the 2021 project, you can scroll to the bottom, you'll see translations and all of our translations are there and available for each of you. So where are we at with the goals project? We are now in week two. So you see, we're meeting our class global goal. We're also getting to know the United Nations. We'll learn a lot more about them today. And we're preparing for designing our project. So in the next few weeks, we're gonna be designing projects. We'll have inventions, we'll have theater productions. We're gonna have some classes and schools that are working on advocacy campaigns with their communities. Maybe they're making videos or they're writing or they're sharing through art. So all these different ways that they're sharing leading up to our big event, which will be March 4th. And that will be our day of solutions and sharing. So you can see our translations with all of the languages represented here. All right, so I know um, in the past, our, our youth ambassador Ayush has been quite a celebrity with our classrooms. And so everyone gets very excited to meet him. So I'm thrilled and honored to introduce you all to Ayush Chopra, um, someone who has become a dear friend of mine. When I began this journey of uh, teaching the SDGs, Ayush was um, a younger man and he had at the same time come across these global goals. And so we, we joined in this journey together. I've had um, the opportunity to work with teachers from around the world and Ayush has been leading the effort for our youth and students. So Ayush, I'd love to uh, have you share a little bit about your work before we turn it over to our team at the UN. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> um, so, hello, everyone. I am Ayush Chopra. I am 18 years old, founder of SDGs for Children and a youth ambassador for the Goals Project. Um, one of the biggest and impactful events of 2019, the Goals Project was designed to be guided a four-week global experience. We began the journey of 1,000 miles with one single step in September 2019, by joining the Goals Project. More than 70 countries and more than 1,500 classrooms worked on 17 global goals and together made the difference. Lot much has happened later, including the global pandemic, but our zeal and effort to work towards Agenda 2030 has become even stronger. The Goals Project has returned this year in even much bigger cohort with 34 global educators and nearly 3,000 global classrooms participating together. None of us can resist the brief thrills of a good grade or a tournament win, but these prizes easily disappear. I'm not saying that the grades are not important. They are very much important in the small and finite context of learning a lesson. We must celebrate each small milestone, but in our journey of shaping a fairer world, we need to have an infinite mindset. We do not know ex the exact form this world will take this, but working towards it together gives our life a meaning. This goals project is an attempt to bring a transformation for all our educators and students to change their mindset from a finite target to an infinite vision. 
and the educators who embrace the infinite mindset build stronger, more innovative, more inspiring are the leaders who can lead us into the future, not only till Agenda 2030, but even beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Ayush. So Ayush will be joining back and we have questions from other students at the end of our session today, but we're thrilled to um, welcome in Elizabeth Victor. And Elizabeth is the Chief of Visitor Services at the United Nations Headquarters in New York City. So anyone from New York City, please wave your hands. And since the start of the pandemic and the closure of the buildings, she's been working with her team from all around the world and helping teachers, students, citizens to attend virtual sessions and tours. So she's gonna introduce a, a few of her special guests and after we finish our visit in a moment. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you, Ayush. And um, it's so exciting to see so many people joining. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I think we're covering every single time zone on the planet. So this is very impressive. I think we've never spoken to so many people at once. So uh, this is definitely a first for us. Um, I, I loved what Jennifer was saying in the in the beginning about having etiquette and having ways of, of talking to each other, because that's very much how we work at the United Nations. So we uh, represent 193 countries. Um, there's 44,000 people working for the UN Secretariat all over the world. 4,000 of those are here in New York. And today you'll meet only four of us. Um, uh, it's a it's a little. Uh, we'd like to give you a little insight into United Nations headquarters at New York. Uh, we'll do that with a short video, um, and then after the video, I have some some of my uh, colleagues, which whom you will recognize from the video, uh, very special guests. Uh, who are here to introduce themselves and uh, speak uh, a little bit more about their work and also answer all of your questions. Um, and we have a few additional colleagues uh, lurking in the background, uh, trying to uh, help you all on your very exciting road towards um, not only learning about the sustainable development goals, the global goals, um, but to find ways of, of making them your own. Um, and that's really what it is about. It's, uh, we like to say, <clears throat> you come and, and visit the United Nations because it is your world. It's not the United Nations world, it's your world. We are all the United Nations. So uh, we're all in this together. And if we work together and support each other, we, we will uh, achieve uh, what we've set ourselves up to do. So uh, I don't want to take too much time. I want to leave plenty of time to the for the questions at the end. Um, so I think we'll have a our little tour now and then um, I'll see you after the end of the tour. Welcome to the United Nations Headquarters. The headquarters in New York City occupies 18 acres of land and overlooks the East River. 75 years ago, in 1945, 51 countries signed the United Nations Charter in San Francisco. By doing so, the member states agreed to work together to save future generations from experiencing the horrors of another world war. With a substantial donation by John D. Rockefeller Jr., New York was decided to be the city to provide the home for the nations of the world. The site by the East River between 42nd Street and 48th Street was previously occupied by slaughterhouses 
and surrounded by continuous foul odor, which had to be demolished to make way for the headquarters of the organization. A team of 11 renowned architects, also known as the Workshop for Peace, and led by Wallace K. Harrison of the United States, designed what came to be known as the headquarters of the United Nations. Here in the Security Council Chamber, delegates work tirelessly to uphold the goals of the United Nations Charter to maintain international peace and security. Seated around the horseshoe-shaped table, 15 members of the Council meet almost on a daily basis to discuss conflict situations around the world. The Chamber was gifted by the Norwegian government and designed by the Norwegian architect Arnstein Arnberg. The blue and gold silk wall coverings and drapes were designed by Elsie Polson and depict the anchor of faith, the growing wheat of hope, and the heart of charity. The mural was designed by the Norwegian artist Herr Krog. Here I am in the Trusteeship Council Chamber. The role of this council was to promote self-determination of non-self-governing territories. When the UN was created in 1945, there were 11 such territories under the supervision of this council. The last of those territories, Palau, gained independence in 1994. Since then, the work of this council was suspended Nowadays, this chamber is mainly used for a variety of conferences. The Trusteeship Council Chamber was designed by a Danish architect and furniture designer, Finio. After 2011, the chamber was restored and equipped with new furniture designed by Casper Salto and Thomas Siskard. Another iconic aspect of this chamber is the statue titled Mankind and Hope. A girl with arms upraised reaching towards a bird which hovers with outspread wings above her head as a symbol of the country's achieving independence. Carved out of a single piece of teak wood, it was made by a Danish sculptor, Henrike Starke. The Economic and Social Council Chamber, also called ECOSOC, is a gift from Sweden. It was originally designed by a Swedish architect, Sven Markelis, who was also part of the team of 11 architects who designed the headquarters. Covering the tall glass windows hangs a curtain by on Ed Hall, Dialogos, reminding us of the mutual exchange of views on equal terms embodied in the deliberations taking place in this chamber. The architect left the ceiling above the public gallery exposed, intentionally leaving the pipes and ducts for everyone to see, which became a symbolic reminder of the ongoing struggle of economic and social development for all. The General Assembly is considered the heart of the organization. All 193 member states meet in the General Assembly Hall to address universal challenges that demand global solutions for a better and a more sustainable future for all. Every September, heads of states and governments are invited to the general debate to speak about issues that concern member states, addressing the world from the black marble rostrum. The General Assembly works on the basis of equality and consensus. Each member state has one vote, the same number of seats, and delegations sit in English alphabetical order. Simultaneous interpretation into the six UN official languages 
Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Spanish, and Russian, facilitates the exchange of ideas on how to solve world problems. The United Nations headquarters is filled with artworks donated by member states. One example of such an artwork is the Norman Rockwell mosaic that eloquently expresses our aspirations for fundamental human rights and freedoms for all, without distinction as to sex, race, religion or language. On the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the United Nations in 1985, the mosaic was presented as a gift by former First Lady Nancy Reagan on behalf of the United States of America. The mosaic was executed by Venetian artists specializing in mosaic works and contains more than 22,000 glass tiles. The mosaic, based on Norbert Rockwell's painting, The Golden Rule, shows a very diverse group of people standing together and displays the words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Rockwell wanted to illustrate how golden rule was a common theme of all major religions of the world and depicted the people of every race, creed, and color with dignity and respect. After the creation of the United Nations, human rights was a major focus. Members worked hard to find a universal standard for human rights, which previously was considered a domestic concern. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. Eleanor Roosevelt was instrumental in coordinating this effort. One of the hidden treasures of the garden is the monument in memory of Eleanor Roosevelt. A granite bench is facing a bas relief of a flame that bears the inscription She would rather light a candle than curse the darkness and her glow has warmed the world. We look forward to welcoming you at the United Nations headquarters in person in the near future or you may choose to take a virtual tour and online briefing. For more information on our virtual events, please go to visit.un.org. Thank you for the virtual tour, Elizabeth. I'd love to welcome you back and to introduce your team, and then we'll get started with questions from our students. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed this little snapshot of uh, our, our beautiful United Nations headquarters building. We'd love to visit, to, to have all of you visit us. Um, and if it doesn't uh, work out in person, then, um, as was mentioned at the end of the video, we welcome you virtually these days, um, wherever you are in the world, any time of day. Uh, so we're, we'd, we'd love to see you. Um, so I am joined today by um, three of my colleagues and you'll recognize them. Uh, so in order of appearance from the video, I have uh, Daria, I have uh, Papa and I have Emily, and I'm going to hand it over in that order to them uh, so they can introduce themselves um, with a little bit more detail. And uh, then we'll take your questions. Daria. <clears throat> Oop, unmuting, not working. Okay, maybe maybe we start with Papa while you work on your unmute. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Papa Dembele from Senegal, uh, West Africa. Uh, I've been with the uh, guided tours unit for a little bit over five years now. I really, really like this job. Uh, one of my uh, main passion regarding uh, 
this position is to be able to interact uh, with the public uh, and use it as a forum uh, or as an opportunity to raise awareness on crucial issues such as uh, climate change, uh, global health, um, uh, conflict, etc. Uh, I'm fluent in English, French, Italian, and Wolof. It's a pleasure to uh, have you here. And of course, as Elizabeth has said, uh, we look forward to having you uh, on UN campus uh, soon. Thanks so much, Papa. Um, I see Daria still struggling with her microphone, which is a, a, a real shame. So uh, maybe Emily, if you want to introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to see all of you here. My name is Emily. I'm from China, and I've been a tour guide uh, in the Guided Tours Unit since 2018, so uh, over three years. Um, one of my passions to work at the United Nations is the fact that I get to know the diverse culture um, from, from visitors, from my colleagues, and I'm able to speak different languages and learn different languages at the UN as well. So excited to see you all and I'm ready for the questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And I should point out Emily is fluent in English, Chinese and French. Yes? Oui, yes. bonjour tout oui, le monde. Bonjour tout le monde. Okay, Daria, please. Yeah. <laughs> yes, finally, I was able to figure this out. So hello, everyone. My name is Daria. Uh, I, along with my colleagues, am a tour guide at the United Nations. I have been working with the United Nations for the last uh, year and a half. Originally, I am from Russia, so I conduct tours in English and Russian. Um, I love what I do. I love being able to talk with everyone, and I'm excited that we are able to do this virtually. So I'm really, really excited to be here and to see everyone and uh, excited to answer your questions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daria. And I, I, am, um, I just was reminded myself uh, that I forgot to tell people where I'm from. So I'm originally from, from Germany. Uh, so we have a very, very multinational, multilingual uh, team. Uh, we come, we have about 40 people um, working to welcome visitors uh, from, I think it's 25 different countries and across the, among the 40 of us, we probably speak around 20 different languages. So, um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful place to work and we're ready for your questions. All right, fantastic. Uh, so wonderful to meet your team, Elizabeth. And we have had students submitting questions over the past week. So what we've done is we kind of looked for themes within the questions. So maybe some people here, your questions are represented in these four that we have for the United Nations team. And the first one I'd love to share, can you share more on the history of the UN? And also students are wondering, why is the headquarters of the UN in New York City? Okay, so I can answer that question. <laughs> so, um... Where do we start? So first, as mentioned in the video, the United Nations was founded after World War II. Uh, 51 member states uh, came together at the time they signed the United Nations Charter. Now there are 193 member states. Um, and originally the United Nations was founded with mainly the purpose of preventing future world wars. But of course, the work of the United Nations goes beyond just preventing future world wars. It works to ensure that everyone has a decent living uh, standard of living. So this goes uh, through working on issues of peace and security, development, and human rights. Um, and now as to the question, why New York City? So when the United Nations was um, created, there were many different cities that were considered uh, as a potential candidate for hosting the organization, such as San Francisco, Philadelphia, but ultimately New York City was chosen because John D. Rockefeller Jr. Uh, at the time, he gave a donation of 8.5 million US dollars for the headquarters to be built um, on the site that it currently uh, stands on.
Fantastic. All right, Ayush, would you like to share our second question from our yeah. Yeah, so in our next uh, major topic for the question two, we have kind of like three questions, three major questions. First being, can you share on how the SDGs started? Second, who created these global goals? And the third one, who is responsible for achieving the goals by 2030? Oh, I, I, is Emily taking those? The mute isn't, the mute, you can't unmute yourself. Oh dear, oh dear. So maybe uh, Papa or Daria? Yeah, I can. Oh dear, uh, there, I see Emily working. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sorry, um, I, I was just working on the muting myself. So could you please repeat the questions? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, first one was, can you share on how the SDGs started? Second one was, who created these global goals? And the third one was, who is responsible for achieving the goals by 2030? Yes, thank you for the questions. Um, so the first one, um, we are going to talk about the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. In 2000, leaders of 189 countries gathered at the United Nations headquarters and signed the historic Millennium Declaration. And together they committed to achieving a set of eight goals that range from halving extreme poverty and hunger to promoting gender equality and reducing child mortality by the target date of 2015. So substantial progress has been made regarding the Millennium Development Goals. For example, the world has already realized the first uh, MDG of halving the extreme poverty rate by 2015. However, the achievements have been uneven. The MDGs are set to expire in 2015 and the discussion of a post-2015 agenda continues. Um, this time, however, the focus is not only on the developing world, but on building a sustainable future worldwide, where environmental uh, sustainability, social inclusion, and economic development are equally valued. So that's why in 2015, the SDGs were adopted by um, member states of the United Nations in the General Assembly. And these 17 goals are set for the future of humanity. They remind us what we need to achieve to make sure we proceed in the right direction as a global community. We want to make sure we develop our world, our land, resources, economies in a sustainable way. And here sustainability means to keep these resources long lasting and available for future generations. So in terms of the uh, second question, um, so who are going to take the responsibility? We need to understand that the SDGs were adopted by all 193 member states. So it should be the government of each member state, as well as their private sectors, companies, even individuals, so us. It's our responsibility to implement these goals. So that is to say, implementation and success will rely on countries' own sustainable development policies, plans, and programs. And these stakeholders include um, governments, civil society, the private sector, and others. And they are expected to contribute to the realization of the SDGs. All right. And uh, um, I kind of forgot the third question. <laughs> so. Yeah, I can repeat the question. Yeah. The uh, third. Who, um, who is responsible for achieving the goals by 2030? And I think you answered that question. Mm -hmm. um, who created the global goals? And can you show on how SDG started? These were the three questions. Yeah, who created the global goals? I also just. Uh, mm -hmm. mentioned and and, think, and the I first question yeah I, I think, think so we, we covered, covered all everything. three <laughs> thank you
Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, Emily. So um, covering the SDGs, we have classrooms here that are working for six weeks on their global goals project. And a lot of them are considering what's happening currently with our world with COVID-19. So our third question to you all on the UN team is around this topic. And students are wondering, how has COVID-19 impacted the goals? And also, how is the UN addressing this pandemic? All right, so I, I could jump in. Uh, yes, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely affected uh, the uh, achievement of these goals. I mean, as, as many of you know, we only have pretty much nine more years left. So now the question is, how can we achieve these goals? Uh, unfortunately, uh, according to the World Bank, uh, as of 2020, for the first time, uh, the world may be experiencing uh, uh, its first increase in extreme poverty um, since 1998. So some of the indicators are going reverse. So there, there are many, many challenges uh, ahead of us. Uh, so in, and for that matter, what that means is that there needs to be uh, even stronger partnership uh, between governments uh, and the private sector, uh, as well as the UN system. Uh, so that uh, we can uh, reach at least some of the goals. Now, when it comes to addressing uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I don't know if you, many, many of you probably know that the World Health Organization is a UN agency. So that's the, that's the organization overseeing uh, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So there have been already several steps uh, undertaken, uh, undertaken by the World Health Organization, including alerting all the member states on, on January 5th uh, about an emerging disease. Uh, now, of course, with that, uh, there are uh, varying responses from, from countries. Uh, and then uh, by January 30th, um, the World Health Organization um, uh, declared the COVID-19 uh, as a public health emergency of international concern. And that's basically a triggering mechanism from which all countries are supposed to put in place uh, measures, logistics uh, to uh, respond uh, to the growing level of infections around the world. And of course, by March 11, the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 a global pandemic. Uh, now, um, of course, we're seeing uh, what's happening around the world, the way it's spreading, uh, the mortality is unfortunately quite high. And, and also their varying level of success. There are some countries that have done very well, uh, such as New Zealand and so forth. Uh, others haven't done so well. Now, in addition to that, uh, the World Health Organization has developed a global mechanism called COVAX. Uh, and this uh, COVAX mechanism is to make sure that uh, countries around the world, especially developing countries, have equal access to vaccines that are being developed by multiple companies. Uh, and for that, that's calling on uh, also the wealthier nations to, to help facilitate that uh, so that the poorer nation have access to, do, to those vaccines at lower cost. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, in our next topic, we are, we got questions regarding the individuals and how individuals can support and work uh, work for United Nations. So regarding that, uh, how can individuals join the United Nations and how can people support the work of the United Nations? So thank you, Ayush. I'm actually going to take that question uh, myself. So I think the easy answer is you already all are supporting the work of the United Nations. Everybody on this call, everybody who is participating in this project is already making a huge impact towards achieving the global goals um, and towards supporting the work of the United Nations. Just by being interested, by learning about the UN, by participating in the projects and making small little differences um, in your individual, uh, in your homes, in your communities, in your schools, um, that's already a really important first step. Um, if the whole world did that, I think we'd all be in a better place. 
Um, I, I'm very happy to see, I, I saw in the questions that were submitted earlier, that number of you asked, can I work for the United Nations? How do I do that? And the, the easy answer is absolutely. There are people from all 193 member countries who work for the UN. And if you are passionate about the work, that we do, there is absolutely a job here for you. Um, there, it's not, we're not just uh, lawyers and uh, um, uh, people who studied international relations, but we have doctors and engineers, uh, we have translators, we have security personnel, we have people like us who work in public information. So there are so many different jobs and opportunities available in the UN system and that it's certainly a, a career that I would encourage everybody to, to consider. Um, as a first step, I know most of you are in school. Um, you could join a UN, a model UN club in your school, in addition to working on this uh, goals project. You can encourage your teachers or your school to um, have a celebration on UN Day, which is our, our birthday on October 24th. You can look at some of the other big international days that the UN marks every year and see how you can celebrate that. World Environment Day in June, or Women's Day on, on um, March 8th. All these are good opportunities to share information about the UN and to learn more about it. Um, and as you, you know, grow in your careers, in your schools, as you start thinking about a career, um, career choices and what you might want to study, uh, it, think about maybe doing an internship at the UN. We don't unfortunately offer internships for school children, uh, but we have a lot of students, university students who come and do internships with us. It's a good way of finding out more about how the actual work happens. Um, and then there's a number of different uh, career paths. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there's 44,000 people who work for the UN. Uh, and not all of us are in New York, of course. There are UN offices all over the world. So here's some a little bit of homework for you. Um, see, find out what UN offices exist in your country, in your city. There are information centers in many, many countries in the world. Um, there are UN agencies that have offices all over the world. Uh, so see, see what exists. And I'm sure they have a project or a program uh, where you can learn more. Maybe they organize school visits. Maybe they have an interesting exhibit that you can visit. Maybe they can send you some materials to your school. So there are a number of different things that you can do now. Um, and uh, go and do your research and find out. And there's certainly uh, an interesting career waiting for you if that's something that you would like to pursue. Elizabeth, we had a, a related question in our chat here from a student wondering how to particularly get a job as a UN headquarters uh, tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful question. We'd love to have uh, more people join us as a tour guide. So there's, um, uh, at the moment, we're because everything is happening remotely and we're working online, we've unfortunately had to stop our, our, um, our recruitment, but it, we have open recruitment. Um, you can send me an email. Uh, we, we do require uh, tour guides to um, have completed their university education. So all of our tour guides are university educated and you need to speak lots of languages. Um, so we, you need to speak uh, fluent English and at least one other language. So that can be your mother tongue. And many of us speak more than one language. So those are the the, uh, and come with a with a with a burning passion to to uh, represent uh, the United Nations. I think I think we all think that would be quite a very cool job. 
Um, we have one more question if we have time, Elizabeth, before we finish up. Uh, this is from Tatiana, one of our goals project facilitators in her classroom in Moldova. And she asks, the UN headquarters was working very hard every day to ensure a good standard of living for everyone. My question is, how are major decisions on different global issues taken at the UN headquarters? That's a really good question. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of at the, at the heart of, of how complicated this work is. Um, I, maybe Bapa or Emily want to take the question? Yes, so I, I could jump in. Um, so when it comes to uh, the major decisions uh, being undertaken at the UN, uh, it is important uh, to understand that the United Nations is what, what is what we call here in our language, intergovernmental institution, meaning that it's a member state based organization. Uh, so whether it is at the Security Council or at the General Assembly, uh, it's the countries that are represented in these organs uh, that take decisions. Now, besides that, of course, you also have the staff members at the UN who do the groundwork, uh, but what they mostly do are to recommend, to give recommendations or to give advice uh, to the diplomats, to the countries, and then the countries make the final decisions. Fantastic. I know our whole world is facing so many um, important issues right now that we're all trying to tackle together. So I think for us having these global goals um, as the glue to help us with this path for action really um, can lead the way. Did Daria or Emily want to add anything to that? It's a really good answer and helps explain a little bit how we work. Maybe just to add that, of course, um, as we mentioned, um, the work of the United Nations is only made possible by the cooperation of the member states, um, because these are global, as we always say, global um, problems require global solutions. So it's really at the heart of it. It's just a matter of working together and remembering um, what we're working for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important um, point to make. And it's not easy. Uh, I think we, we like to tell people, remember, uh, you know, just think about how complicated it can be to decide what to have for dinner, you know, in, in your own family. Uh, there's only maybe five or six of you who need to come to a decision. And we have uh, much bigger decisions to make and 193 countries who each have their own opinion. Uh, so the process can take a long time, um, but it is very important and it's, it's at the, the, this negotiation and talking to each other and finding common ground is really at the heart of the work of the United Nations. And one, one final question, I think, would, which would be a great way to end. It's actually a two part question. One part is from Maya asking if there will be more goals and beyond the 17. And then we also have multiple students asking what's going to happen after 2030. So kind of a two part question for you all as we think about heading off from this call, this project in March, and then what's going to happen after 2030. Emily, do you want to answer that? Yeah. SDG is your topic. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, though it is almost <laughs> impossible to estimate what will happen beyond 2030 now. Again, um, we can always trace back to the years of 2000 and 2015 and uh, find some clues from there. Um, we see the Millennium Development Goals first, and then we have the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and also, um, in terms of the future, uh, I would like to quote Nelson Mandela, who once said, "It always seems to um, it always seems impossible until it's done." So the SDGs are some of the things that must be done. If you look at our response to COVID nineteen, for example, we dramatically change our lives, and we have shown an enormous capacity to adapt to new circumstances. So that means change is possible. 
And what is important is the political will, is that mm -hmm. everybody uh, is part of the solution. We are all part of the solution. So again, um, it should be the government of each member state, as well as um, the companies and individuals' responsibilities to implement the goals. And for us, everybody can take actions. So for example, if you search the lazy person's guide to saving the world, um, there are some super easy things we can adopt into our routines that will make a big difference if we all do it. So things from turning off the lights if we, do, if we don't need them or shop local that can support neighborhood businesses, um, keep people employed and helps prevent trunks from um, driving far distances. So yes, um, everybody should be part of the solution. Now, I just wanted to add uh, onto that, uh, whether there will be something beyond uh, 2030. Uh, well, we, we had, uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned, Emily, we had first the Millennium Development Goals from 2000 to 2015, then the Sustainable Development Goals adopted in 2015, expected to expire by 2030. So what is likely going to happen is that before 2030, there will probably be an evaluation uh, about the accomplishment uh, with the sustainable development goals. And there is a possibility that there may be uh, another development agenda beyond 2030. And just to remind people what you saw in the video, and it's fitting that Papa mentioned this, that the, the, the Economic and Social Council is the, the part in the UN and the, the, the uh, space in the UN headquarters where a lot of these uh, discussions are, are happening, where a lot of these debates take place. And if you remember back in the video, the ceiling is unfinished. It's open, it's raw. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a symbolic reminder to all of us that the work is never finished. So the 2030 is a deadline because it's always good to have a deadline and something to work towards. You probably know this when you're preparing your homework, it's nice to know when it's due, but that doesn't mean that you then stop learning. You then, you finish your homework, you achieve a goal, you, you see, okay, what can I do next? What can I do to improve further? What, what is the next step? And that's, I think, um, the, the, the same goes for, for global cooperation. So thank you so much for all the fantastic questions. And, and thank you to my lovely team for, for being part of this. So Jennifer and Ayush, back to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you to your team for these wonderful uh, responses. So. If you've been following the chat, we have so many students with really wonderful, um, also insightful questions that they have for their your team, Elizabeth. How can we keep the conversation going? I know we shared about your Twitter handle and there's a hashtag, but for students who may not be on social media, how can they keep in contact with you all, learn more? We'll continue to share with their teachers, but if they have questions that they would like to directly send to you all, do you have recommendations on how they can get in touch? there. Um, we love to hear from students. We love to hear from everybody. Um, so if you go to our website, visit.un.org, um, there is an opportunity there to submit questions and to ask questions. Um, we also have... <clears throat> We have some resources that are available on our page, and it's more of a collection of, of good ideas and links and other places where you can find more information. Um, but yes, please um, do feel free to uh, send us an email, um, fill out the form on the website, uh, tweet us, send us a direct message, uh, send us a question on Facebook. We do answer everything we get. Um, and we love to hear from people everywhere. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're three or, or you know, 93, uh, we, we will answer your question. Um, 
So at the moment, as we uh, Jennifer mentioned in the beginning, everything we do is online and virtual. We offer these virtual tours. Um, you can you can book a tour for your class, for your school, for your family. Um, we offer tours especially for children. Uh, for different ages, and we have a couple of specialized tours in the United States this this month, February is Black History Month, so we're offering a special tour uh, focusing on Black history and on racial equality. Uh, actually, Papa, who, who, whom you've heard from earlier, is, is one of the, the key drivers behind that tour. Um, and uh, we would like to offer a, a, a special a uh, special discount to anybody who is in the uh, goals project. So if you if you mention uh, Teach SDGs 50 um, when when you book your tour, uh, you'll you'll uh, be able to take get a get a special offer on that. So we really hope that we see lots of you uh, at the UN uh, or online or both. And we'll be sure to share that out. So. We have had we've had a full room this entire time with a thousand participants joining from all around the world. And I know we have many who are trying to get in also. So if you have friends who are trying to join in for our session today, please pass on the message that we have a recording and we will be sharing that with them, along with all of the resources that were shared by the United Nations team today. So please watch for that in your email inboxes. And with that, I'd love to bring back Ayush for some closing words, some messages of inspiration for all of our students who are taking action around the world and their teachers who are supporting them. Um, first of all, I would like to thank, uh, say thanks to everyone that has joined, especially all the UN officials. Thank you so much for giving us your precious time and answering the questions. And I know there were a lot of chat going on every single second with everyone asking their questions on SDGs, on how they can join. And I, I would love if you could, guys, if you can answer all the questions, but it's not possible uh, for this time limit, but I'm sure we'll be able to uh, get in touch with you. Our students will be able to get in touch with you for um, you to answer those questions. And I'd say once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. And um, I will pass back to Jennifer Williams now. Yes, thank you. So on behalf of myself and Kuhn Temmers and everyone on the Take Action Global team, our facilitators, our youth ambassadors and interns, we thank the United Nations for supporting us and for answering our student questions. I'm sure we will have many more over the next few weeks as our classrooms are working on figuring out what projects they're going to be completing and then preparing for our big event on March 4th. So please be sure to follow along on the website and on social media at hashtag goals project. And we hope everyone stays safe and healthy and thank you for being with us today. So goodbye. Thank, thank you, you for having you. us. And thank you for everybody who's working on the project. Yeah, Fantastic. Bye, Keep everyone. up the good work. Bye. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much and uh, be safe.